in uh, last year, he came down to Peru on a, on a trip, and he helped preach our Bible conference. And it was just an amazing conference. Let me tell you, your pastor can preach. I just, uh, that was one of the conferences that I enjoyed more than any other. We had, I don't know if you all know uh, Brother Earl Brigham in the Deaf Ministry. You may be familiar with Brother Earl Brigham or Brother Bruce Kelly. He's a deaf pastor here in Atlanta. So we had two deaf pastors, and we had one hearing pastor. Now, I don't know if any of you have come to a place and, and, and seen a deaf pastor preach, but let me tell you, a deaf pastor can preach, amen? Amen. And your pastor can preach, and so we had a great time. It was a powerful conference. I still remember one of the messages he spoke on uh, more than any other. It was uh, washing of the feet. And he talked about how Jesus humbled himself, and Jesus would go before his disciples after each one of them, in different ways, and stab him in the back. After, after, um, who was it? After uh, John and James, I believe, the, the sons of thunder, they said, Jesus, why don't you just destroy that city? Going against everything Jesus had been teaching all that time. Jesus said, listen to me. Um, Jesus said, I am here to bring forgiveness, and not, not hate. I am here not to destroy, but to restore. And when he knew that Peter was going to deny him just that same, very same morning, when he knew that Thomas would doubt him, when he knew all these things, when he knew that, G, that Judas, the, uh, the ultimate in traitors, was about to turn around and kiss him and then give him over to the, the Romans, give him over to the Jews, Jesus still washed his feet. And so that just stuck with me to this day. But let me tell you, one other thing about this church that I've noticed since I got here. I have not been in a church that's been more friendly than this church. Amen. And I say that with all sincerity. In fact, uh, Brother Lee uh, was telling me, you know what, we might need a cattle prod to get everyone back together to continue the service. Um, and, you know, he said that in humor. But, you know what? It's a blessing when a church enjoys fellowship. And when yes. a church enjoys reaching out the hand to somebody, to a stranger, and saying, you know what, you're welcome here, and we're glad you're here. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, let's pray this morning as we get started. I want to talk about Jesus as the center of our lives. I want to talk about our Lord and our Savior as the very essence of who we are and a molding and shaping our lives around that. I want to speak about Jesus, our cornerstone. So let's pray that the Lord would give us power this morning. Lord, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for all you're doing in our lives, Lord. And we thank you that you give us the opportunity to gather on a Sunday morning and worship you. We thank you that we have the opportunity to study your word. We thank you that we have the opportunity to approach your throne of grace boldly, because we know that you come. You are the mediator. Lord, there could be no other mediator besides Jesus, the God I am. Lord. We thank you for that. We thank you for your glory. We thank you for your power. And Lord, we ask that we lift you up. Lord, move me aside. Lord, allow your word to speak to someone this morning, Lord. I ask that you would touch hearts and lives and make a difference. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's look in the book of Ephesians to start out. Ephesians chapter 2. If you'd open your Bible there. And let's look in verse 19. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Uh, go ahead and rise, if you would. Ephesians 2, 19. And let's read the word of God together. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God. He's speaking of the Gentiles here. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. In whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Thank you. You may be seated. The word of God here talks about a building. It talks about a structure that you might compare to this church. You have the roof, you have the, the altar, you have the pews, you have the windows, you have every part of a structure that is used to give glory to God. This auditorium, because we know that the church of the people present here, amen, we know that you are the church of God. If you are a believer, if you are a member of this local body of believers, then you are the church of God. But we know that this structure was constructed, it was built or was purchased in order to give glory to God. Yes. So that we would have a place where we could meet together and we could worship God together. And that's what it's talking about here in this passage. It says that, you know what? We can compare this physical structure 
to our, our relationship, our social structure, if you would. And the core of it, the center, the center of the structure that God is building for His own glory, which will bring up more glory than anything mortal man could build, is Jesus Christ. It says in verse 20, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone. You know, God is great. God is the Creator, and He is the Savior. God is a God of justice, and God is a God of mercy. God is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. God is a God who is greater than any of us could ever imagine. Amen. God created this universe. God knew we would be here this morning before He ever breathed life into Adam, before He ever created the sun, moon, and stars, before this earth was, was without form and void. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We know that God is greater than all things. I think sometimes we lose sight of this. I think sometimes we see God as our, our friend and our father, and that's wonderful. That's how we should see God. And that's how God wants us to see Him. He wants us to see Him as our Heavenly Father. But I think it's important to maintain our respect and our sincere fear and awe of who God is. Yes. Because the Bible says that God is a terror to the wicked. And the Bible says that God is a wall of protection. Remember the children of Israel in the Old Testament? There was a column, there was a pillar of cloud and of fire. It was a pillar of cloud and of darkness and of fear to the Egyptians who were pursuing after the children of Israel, the people of God trying to destroy them. And it was a pillar of fire, of light, of hope, of promise to the Israelites on the other side. We see that this pillar dividing the evil, if you would, the people who rejected God, the people who did not recognize God for who He was, and the people of God. But we know that either way, He's God. Amen. He is a great God, and He is worthy of our love and of our respect. And He's worthy of more than just your Sunday morning. I'm just being honest here. Our God is worthy of more than just a little sliver of your life. Amen. Our God is worthy of more than just a prayer and a meal. Our God is worthy of more than opening up your Bible in the morning, reading a verse, and then going through the day, forgetting about the Word of God, forgetting about God, and just living your life as you've learned to live it throughout your growth and development, from your parents, from your relatives, from your family, going on with your life, life as you know it. Now, our God is worthy of building our lives. Jesus is not only the chief cornerstone of this church, not only the chief cornerstone of everything God is doing, but He should be the chief cornerstone of your life. He should be the central component of everything you are. Yes. So let's look at what that means. Let's read a verse first, if you would. Psalm 48. The Bible says, you don't need to open there, but you can if you like. Psalm 48, I always like to see what the preacher's saying, make sure it's, make sure it's the right thing, amen? amen? Psalm 48, verse 1 says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion, the size of the north, the city of the great king. Our God is a great God, and He's worthy of all praise. Yes. And so, I think, I think sometimes... I think sometimes we push that aside in our lives. I think sometimes we look at God and we say, God, you are great and wonderful. We might even be able to get up on a Sunday morning and, say, and pray. I don't, some churches, they have the, the, the men of the church stand up and pray, and I think that's a wonderful thing. And they'll, they'll stand up and pray, Oh Lord God of the universe, worthy to be praised, and they'll give Him all the glory that, that is due in His speech. But let's make sure we practice that in our own lives. Let's look at some people in the Word of God today, people in the Word of God that did not put God as their first priority. Let's look at some people in the Word of God who gave God lip service. And I'm not saying anyone here is this way this morning. I don't even know you folks. I'd like to get to know you. I, I enjoy spending some time with you this morning. But let me just tell you, there are people in every church, in every country. I grew up in Peru, South America. I come here to the States. Everywhere you go, there are people who will give lip service to God. But when it comes right down to it, they're just tacking God on. They're just painting a cross on, on the outside of their lives. They're just adding God as one more piece of the puzzle. It's like those people in Peru who are, are, are uh, 
Catholics and they pray to Jesus, but and I'm not I'm not bashing Catholics. I, I believe that the Bible says we should show love to everyone, but I believe that the Catholic doctrine is wrong in it. Right. I believe that the Catholic doctrine, which says that um, that we should pray to Mary, that says that we should trust in our works for our salvation, I believe that's wrong. Yeah. I just want to clarify that. But there are so many Catholics that I see in Peru that live one way and, and talk another. You talk to them and say, they say, oh, I love God. Oh, I believe in the power of God to, to, to make a difference in my life. In fact, I even pray to him when I get in a hard scrape. But you know what? When it comes right down to it, they're living wicked, sinful lives. Now, we can say that about the Catholics and pat ourselves on the back for not being Catholics. But there's Baptists who live that way too. Right. Maybe they don't go and drink and party and, and, and live a wild life like some of these people I'm talking about. Maybe they do. But they're not building God into their decisions. Let's look in the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis, chapter number 27, if I remember correctly. Let's start with chapter 25. Genesis chapter 25. We're going to look at the story of Esau in Genesis 25, 26, and 27. Esau was a man who... We knew from the very beginning that he was in trouble. In fact, it was prophesied. His mother asked, why am I thus? Why is it that I feel something in my womb that is, that is, that is different? And she went to ask the Lord. And God said, you know what? You have twins. Congratulations. And, and, and so she, she was excited about that, I'm sure. She had her babies. But right, as, right when she was having her children, there was a prophecy that made that was fulfilled. The elder, the one who came out first, was being held back by his brother. In fact, the one who came out first uh, had a, a cord tied around one of his limbs to indicate that he'd come out first. But then the other one just kind of squeezed that after him. And there was a prophecy that the Lord made at that time. Um, I like prophecy. I don't like uh, prophecy when it's not God's prophecy because I don't believe in any prophecy that's not of the Lord. I don't believe in Nostradamus. I don't believe in any other prophet besides a prophet of the Lord. Hey. But the word of God says that Jacob, the younger, will be served by Esau, the elder. And that was a prophecy that was made before they even had a chance to live, before they had a chance to, to do anything right or wrong. But you know what? God knows all things. The Lord knows what's in your heart, and the Lord knows what will be in your heart 20 years from now, 30 years from now. The Lord knows the course of your life. And I believe that the Lord wasn't so much declaring that I am going to curse Esau from birth as much as he was saying, this will be the way it will be, because I know their hearts. Now, you may not agree with me on that, but I believe that the Lord gives us free will to choose our paths. But I do believe that he can turn our hearts, and I believe he molds us. He molds us and he shapes us based on what we choose to be. If we choose to be a faithful servant of the Lord, God is not going to cause us to sin. The Bible says that we, as Christians, are free from sin if we simply choose to serve God. We are no longer slaves to sin. But I do believe that if you choose to rebel against the Lord, the Word of God clearly indicates that God will harden hearts and God will use people. And in fact, He will even cause people to do things that are against His will. He hardened Pharaoh's heart. He made the children of Israel stay in the, promise, or stay in the land of Egypt longer. But you know what? Pharaoh was a wicked man who, who, who rebelled against God. That's just a little uh, philosophical issue. You know, free will and, and determination. I believe that God allows every one of us to choose whether we are going to walk with God or whether we are going to rebel against Him. Hey, yeah, right. And so Esau, and God knew it, God knew it before he was born, Esau chose to despise his birthright. Esau chose to despise what God had for him in his life. You know, the Word of God says something special about Abraham. Abraham was a friend of God. Abraham was the man that God chose to beget a great and mighty nation. Abraham was the man whom God chose to bless the entire earth. And Abraham was the man who left that heritage to his son, Isaac. Isaac was, what was the sole recipient of that blessing. Now, the other children of Abraham became nations. God blessed them because they were the children of Abraham. But Isaac had the promise 
And Isaac had two children, Jacob and Esau. And Jacob received a blessing, and Esau did not. Let's look at the book of Genesis, chapter 25. And if you would, look in verse 29. The Bible says, And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. He was tired, he was hungry. Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. So far, so good. We have a couple brothers in the field. One of them is baking some dinner, sawing, uh, boiling some, some soup, some stew, some beans. And another brother says, I'm hungry. Will you give me, some, give me some of your food, please? And Jacob, always the sly one, always the sneaky one, says, Well, I need something back from you. Give me your birthright. Give me the promise. Give me the right you have as the elder son of our family to inherit that blessing. To receive that blessing of God. To be, to be that tool which God uses to bless the nations. You know, Esau didn't think of it like that. Esau said, you know what? I'm going to die anyway if I don't get something to eat. Now, do you really believe that? Do you really believe that Esau couldn't have survived if he hadn't had that simple meal? You know, there are people that fast. And I know someone who's fasted for 40 days. I'm not recommending it unless you have clear leading in the Lord and you're prepared medically and you talk to your doctor because that's a long fast. But there are people that have fasted for 40 years that I know personally. Or 40 days, I'm sorry. And not 40 years. And, and you know what? I think Esau could have hung on a little bit longer. But the Bible says in verse 24, at the end of the verse, it says, He did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. To despise is an interesting word. In our modern language, we normally use it for hating or detesting, but it also means to, 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 to not see the value of something, to see it as pointless. If I despise someone, it doesn't necessarily mean I hate them, it just means I think that they're no good, they're worthless. If I, in fact, in the Spanish translation, the word used there means to, to, to consider of no value. And that's what the word to despise means here. Esau saw his birthright as something that just wasn't worth hanging on to. He saw God, because you know what that promise, you know what that birthright was? That was the promise of God through Abraham. That was the promise that Abraham would pass on to Isaac, and that they would pass on to their children, that there would be a great nation, all the earth would be blessed, and Esau didn't care. Esau said, you know what's more important to me? It's what I want right now. It's my food. It's my stomach. It's my life. Because who cares about this birthright and millions of children years from now? I don't care about that. I care about my stomach because I'm hungry. And guess what? He had every right, in a manner of speaking, to make that choice because God allowed him to choose that direction. But when he tried to hang on to it later, it was too late. If we look a little further on, we see Esau begging for that same birthright. Let's look in Genesis chapter 27. We see uh, Isaac in verse 32, chapter 27, verse 32. Isaac, his father, said unto him, speaking with Esau, he said, Who art thou? Who are you? Who art thou? And he said, I am thy son, thy firstborn son, Esau, thy firstborn Esau. And Isaac trembled. Very exceedingly, and said, Who? Where is he that had taken venison and brought it me, and I have eaten of all before thou camest, and have blessed him? Yea, and he shall be blessed. And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry, and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father, give me this blessing. My, my brother, he stole it from me. He stuck it before me. He fed you this venison. He said he was meat. And that's not the way it should be, Father. That's not the way it should be. Dad, give me your blessing because I deserve this. I should have had this. This is my birthright. Wait a second. Didn't he give that away? Didn't he sell that to Jacob for a measly pot of pottage? Didn't he already say, I don't care about this blessing that my father would bestow upon me and my descendants for all time? I think he did. Would you agree? I think that Esau chose his path. And I think that Esau despised the blessings of God. And he saw the consequences. That's not the only instance we see of Esau despising God's promise, despising God's blessing. 
Let's look in chapter 26. We'll go back one chapter. Genesis chapter 26 and verse 34. The Bible talks about Esau's marriage. You know, I'm a young single man. I'm looking to get married sometime here soon. Uh, don't have the money yet for a ring, but, you know, Lord willing, that'll happen pretty soon. There's a young lady back in Peru that I'm uh, in a relationship with right now. I don't know how Esau made it this long, but he was 40 years old, okay? He was about the same age that Isaac was, if I remember correctly, when Isaac first met his wife, uh, Esau and uh, Esau's parents, um, Isaac and Rebecca. Isaac met his wife, Rebecca, when he was 40, and they married so we look at this, and Esau doesn't do what Isaac did. What did Isaac do? Does anyone remember what Isaac did? Isaac waited for his father to send his servant back all the way, all the way back to where they had, they had come out of, where Abraham's family was. Because Abraham knew that these people would be would produce a wife for his son that would carry on that love for God. That's what I believe. I, I can't see any other reason why Abraham would be so concerned that his son not marry a daughter of the land. They had to go all the way back to where at least there was some hope that they would have a fear of God. Well, guess what? Esau was in the same boat. Now, I'm 40 years old. I'm single. You know, I want to have a family of my own. But he doesn't wait for his father. Look what Esau does. Esau took to wife Judith, the daughter of uh, Beri, the Hittite, and Bashamath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, which were a grief of mind unto Isaac and to Rebekah. Now, if they were a grief of mind to Isaac and Rebekah, do you think Esau spoke to his parents about this before he made that decision? I don't think so. Now, I don't know what your philosophy of relationships is. I don't know what your philosophy of dating or courting or... Um, having a relationship to a man or a young woman. But I believe that most of you in this room would agree with me that the biblical principle is that a parent should be involved in that decision. And if you don't agree with me, I believe that if you study it, you will come to that conclusion. The Bible is very clear that a father's wisdom is important in a son's life. And what's the most important decision that a man can make apart from, what he's going to, uh, apart from his trust in Christ as Savior? Uh, I've heard many preachers say that the second most important decision in my life is when I married my beautiful sweetheart who I've been with for uh, 50 years. And you know what? That's really true. And to say that I'm going to reject my father's wisdom in this is a tragic error. And it happens more often than we'd like to admit, even today. But Esau despised his birthright. He despised his father's counsel. Can we be surprised that, that he never received the blessing of God on his life? He tried to tack God on. He wanted the, po the pottage, but he still wanted the birthright. He wanted the, the wives that he wanted to pick. But then we look later on in chapter 28 of Genesis, when Isaac sends Jacob, and the, uh, the pretext of his trip was to go get married. Uh, we know that he was fleeing from Esau, his brother, because he was afraid of him. But... There, there's some truth to the element there that, that Isaac did not want his son, and Rebecca did not want her son, to marry a daughter of the land. Look at verse 6 in chapter 28. When Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Pan and Aram to take him a wife from thence, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughter of the king. And that Jacob obeyed his father. Note that. He obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to Pan and Aram. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father. Oh, I hadn't noticed. Huh. My wives aren't pleasing to my dad and mom. I just noticed. Sorry about that, dad and mom. Let me marry somebody you'll like. So he married a third wife. How many of y'all think that was a great idea? I, I don't think anyone here would say that's a great idea. Okay, so I have two wives who are a constant grief of mine to my mother. Let me just go marry another one. Maybe that'll make everything right. He was tacking on God's blessing, trying to tack on God to a life that he'd chosen for himself. And let me tell you something, that never works. You will never be content. You will never be blessed if you live your life the way you want to live your life, and then you, then you put a chain around your neck with a little cross. Then you paint WWJD on the back of your car. Then you say, but I love Jesus. 
Well, are you listening to him? Are you listening to Are you consulting his word before you make your life decisions? Is he the cornerstone, the foundation of your life plan? Remember, every one of us lives our life in a direction. Some of us are living our lives based on what we believe God wants us to do. And that's the way you should be living it. Because guess what? At the end of the day, that's the only thing that will matter. Because God, remember, he's a great God. God is not a, a friend who you should listen to and smile and say, I'll think about that. God is a friend who you should say, God, if that's what you want, if that's what would be best for me, then I'm there. I'm right there. If you want me to do this instead of that, if you want me to say no to this relationship, if you want me to say no to that job opportunity, or if you're just telling me through godly counsel that maybe this isn't the way I should go, I'm right there, God. Amen. I'm with you. I am not going to make a choice. I am not going to eat a bowl of pottage to make myself feel better than I can have the blessing of God in my life. Yes. You need to make that choice right now. I am not going to marry a daughter of the land when there's a daughter of the family just waiting. I am not going to try to tack on God's blessing once I notice that there's bumps in the road. I'm going to choose right now. You know, every step of the way, we make decisions. You don't ruin your life with one choice. You can, but, but it's a series of choices. Every choice has its consequences, and there's forgiveness, and there's reconciliation. Until you are gone from this earth, there is opportunity for reconciliation with others and with God. But every choice you make has its consequences. And if you live your life making those choices that honor God, if you live your life looking to say, God, you're first, and I'll follow what you have to say because that's what's going to come out right for me, well then, your life, at the end of the day, will be the life of blessing. You will inherit the birth crown so to speak. I don't have much time left, but I wanted to talk about one other group of people in Ephesians, or I'm sorry, in Acts, in the book of Acts, who do the same thing. If we look in the book of Acts, chapter, let me see here, the book of Acts, chapter 19, we see the seven sons of, of Sceva. And these gentlemen were, the Bible describes them as vagabonds. The Bible describes them as, as lazy young people who did it work that just went around making trouble. That's really what these people were. Okay? Now I know that that's a stereotype in, you know, for, for uh, young people, for some people. You know, I know that there are people out there who just talk about the youth and they, all they do is just criticize the youth of today. Right? And maybe some of you young people are a little frustrated by that, saying, well, all they do is they just talk about how lazy we are and how we never work and how we just this and that and the other. Well, you know, I understand. But at the same time, there's a lot of young people today who are like that. There are a lot of young people today who instead of starting to work and starting to honor their parents and starting to, to help out in the house, are sitting around all day doing nothing. And that's a shame. It's a shame for any family. Let's look at the book of Acts, chapter 15, and we're going to look down in, I'm sorry, I said 19, Acts chapter 19, and we'll look in verse 13. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits in the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preached. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests which did so. So we have seven sons of who is supposedly the religious leader in this town. The chief priest, it says, a Jew, a religious man who has seven sons, who are lazy good for nothings, who went around calling out the name of Jesus and living like a devil. But, guess what? These men... They're like many of us. Inside, and what they're doing in their life choices, they're doing whatever they want. But outside, in their actions, in their mouth, in their speech, in their statements, Paul, Jesus, I choose to serve God, I choose to cast out the devil. I'm not going to pretend you're demon-possessed. That might give me in trouble. 
Here's a gentleman here, all right, who is possessed with a, a demonic spirit. He's got, literally, according to the Bible says, he has ministers of Satan inside of him who are controlling part of what he does. They are messing up his life. All right? Now, that's a reality. That's the truth. And then you have seven men over here who are playing church, who are playing at wanting the blessings of God, who are playing at doing it right, who are playing at making a difference in this person's life. And they come over here and say, what do they say exactly? They say, in the name, we adjure you by Jesus. In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, get out of him. They're mocking Christ. They're mocking Paul. And look at the result. The evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know. But who are you? Who do you think you are to call out the name of Jesus? To call out the name of Christ? To profess to believe in a Savior that, that is the author and finisher of all things. And then to live like you want. And to act like you want. Who are you? And the man whom the evil spirit was leapt on them and overcame them. And prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling in Ephesus. And fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. You see, God is great. We've emphasized that. And I'll continue to emphasize that throughout my life. Because He is. I am not great. You are not great. God is great. And until we realize that God is great, until we have a, a healthy fear of God, a healthy respect, a fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom in it, until we have that fear of God in ourselves, and we realize that God isn't a magnet on our fridge, that God isn't our status symbol, that God isn't our bracelet, that God isn't our tool set when things go wrong. God is the cornerstone of our lives. We must build our lives around Him. We must make those decisions, the initial decisions, those life calls, those, those moments when we choose whether I'm going to do what I want to do or whether I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And we know it. Every one of us knows that. You know, there's so many desires in our hearts. There's so many um, good things that we'd like to do, good things we'd like to have. But if you're seeking God, then you know. You know when you're choosing something based on what you want or when you're choosing something based on what God wants. You know when you're putting up the mirror of spirituality on it and you're saying, you know what, Lord? I know that you want me to want, have this because I want it. And I know that you want whatever I want because the Bible says that the Lord fulfills the desires of our heart. Amen? Well, that's true. But there's a lot of desires in our hearts and not all of them are God honoring. And Esau had a lot of desires in his life. And we see how that turned out. And these seven sons of Sceva, they sure wanted to kick that demon out. But they were living life the way they wanted to live it. And Jesus wasn't anywhere there. You know, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this this morning. Are you making Christ the pillar and ground of your life? Are you making him the center of your life? The wise men didn't build his house with a plaque in front that said Jesus. He built his house on the rock of Jesus Christ. You know, I've heard many people say that Christ should be in the passenger seat, or, or Christ is my co-pilot. You know, Christ should be the driver of your life. And so let me ask you this tonight, or this morning. When you choose, when you decide with all your heart that you will make Christ the center, the cornerstone, the pillar and ground of your life, and that every decision that you make, every decision, because he deserves it, every decision in your life will be centered around the fact that he is Lord. If you will do that, then you can say that I am with Christ, and Christ is with me, and I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. You can say that 